Support for Arkansas Week provided by the Arkansas Democrat Gazette, the Arkansas Times, and KUAR-FM 89. Hello again, everyone. Thanks very much for joining us. Schooling in the era of COVID-19. Public education for tens of thousands of Arkansas students will resume August 24th, though just how public remains unclear. How many parents will choose to keep their youngsters at home and rely on distance learning? How many kids will return to the classroom for on-site instruction? How many will choose a blend of the two? The underlying issue is, of course, safety, not only for pupils, but faculty and staff. A lot to cover and to address those issues. We're joined in this edition by Jared Cleveland, superintendent of the Springdale School District, John Collins, superintendent of the West Memphis Schools, and Carol Fleming, who is president of the Arkansas Education Association. Let me begin, if I may, gentlemen, with our two superintendents and ask kind of a bizarre question. As we approach the start of a new school year, about five weeks away now, uh, this reporter keeps hearing complaints from around the state about shifting rules, shifting regulations, shifting timelines, shifting curriculum. So I would ask you two gentlemen, what do you know, what do you not know, and do you know what you don't know? <laughs> Would you like me to start? I'll sure, go ahead, right ahead. Well, yeah, we'll start. Well, we understand, I believe, all across the state that we're in a pandemic. I don't know about you, Mr. Barnes, but I've not lived through one of these, and I don't believe our governor or secretary of education has either. So they're doing the best they can to pivot as much as they can and provide the right kind of uh, direction to us as they see fit. And, you know, if any people in this world, especially in this state, can monitor and adjust, it's a teacher and it's an administrator. So our efforts really are not focused on what to complain about, but what we can look at and, and, and see is good and then create an opportunity for innovation so our students can stay connected to us all across the state, but really in Springdale to focus on us to, to, uh, to make sure that we stay connected with them. Yeah, Mr. Collins of West Memphis. I would concur with Dr. Cleveland's statement. Um, it's uh, it's obviously a very challenging time. And um, as he mentioned, there's not a, a single soul in education that's taken a class or read a book on how to manage through a national or global health pandemic. Um, I think that uh, the focus has to be on what tomorrow brings and, and how we move forward. Uh, we understand that the information has been pretty fluid coming uh, from the CDC to the, to the state health departments through the Department of Education. And, and I agree, Governor Hutchinson, um, about the second or third day that he started making tours to speak to um, folks across the state with his press conferences, he was in West Memphis. And, and we had a very good, uh, a closed door session with him with our local county superintendents, uh, community college uh, president, chamber of commerce, uh, state legislators. And, and I think we're receiving information as it comes. And, and depending on what news outlet you, you watch or, um, or what data source you're tracking, uh, it, it, it can be at times like drinking out of a fire hose. Uh, we're processing a lot. We're processing a lot of layered information. Um, obviously, we know more about um, the pandemic and, and, and COVID-19 and how to address some of, the, some of the concerns a lot better than we did coming out of the spring. And so I feel very confident in our state's reentry plan. Uh, I know there have been several task force that have put a lot of hard um, hours into this and getting us ready. And I feel confident that uh, in West Memphis we'll be ready to meet the the, the needs. There's going to be challenges and there's going to be some unknowns and, and nobody has a crystal ball to, to know where we're going to be uh, in the state in September or October. But uh, I think we've all got to take it with a day by day approach and, and it's a measured response. There's going to be calculated risk with everything we do from, you know, pumping gas to buying groceries. But I think from a from a state education standpoint, I think we're ready. Ms. Fleming, President Fleming, are we calculating the risk 
to an appropriate degree. So from our standpoint, and from the standpoint that we have been hearing from educators across the state, we have to really take into consideration the advice of the medical expert. We cannot open up our schools until medical experts tell us when. We have to have their input. When we consider how we are going to reopen our schools, then we have to have the voice of the educators. Well, and, and yours, according to a survey, I believe that you released just a couple of days ago, your members have some serious reservations about the preparedness of not these just two, these two districts specifically, but statewide. Yes. In terms of safety, school safety. Yes. 90% of our respondents said that they have concerns for the um, safety and health of our children. They, um, they put children first. And yes, we know that our educators are also at risk, but we have to consider our students first and foremost. We know that digital learning does not replace in-person instruction. We know that that is um, very important for the social and emotional development of our children. But we have to consider, are we going to be able to safely um, instruct our children in our schools and follow the social distancing requirements and follow those health and safety requirements in regards to sanitizing and disinfecting our schools. Well, let me follow up, Ms. Fleming. Uh, it would sound as though there is broad skepticism among your membership that we're prepared to do that. I wouldn't call it skepticism. What um, our members are saying is that we really have to have a collaborative effort with um, the Department of Education and the Department of Health and the Department of Health needs to weigh in very strongly in regards to when we open our school. And again, how we open our schools has to include the voice of the educators. Well, are they being heard or are they not being heard? Is the collaboration as you put it there? So that's a very good point. Um, it varies across the state, as you know, the state department or the state board of education just recently approved 160 waivers that each um, school district is able to implement in the upcoming year. Now, the um, individual school districts have to have a ready to, yes, it's a ready to learn committee. And so the ready to learn committee is going to implement a plan for their individual district. So we're getting guidance from the state department, but then Ultimately, the decisions are being left at the local level. And some locals are not including the voice of the educators. And that's why we say that the voice of the educators have to be included. Dr. Cleveland, uh, Mr. Collins, are we, are, are your particular districts, uh, are you listening to the teachers? I believe we are. We have our director, our chairman of the personal policy committee, her, her name is Miss Jill Law. She's been instrumental in helping us uh, hear the voice of the teacher. We also have our Springdale Education Association president, Miss Corey Tucker, who's been instrumental helping us navigate this as well. So not just those two leaders, but we are paying attention and listening to any staff member, whether it be a teacher or a custodian or a bus driver. We're listening to those concerns and trying to make sure that, that uh, we can provide as much information as we can to help them with comfort, to ease back into the school. But if we can't, we need to make sure that we're listening to see if there is a path toward comfort for those folks. You know, we, we value our employees tremendously. We're doing this together. I don't, I don't think anyone out there is uh, trying to operate in isolation. In fact, the superintendents of this region out of our educational co-op, we talk just about daily, whether it's as a group, or it's individual to individual. So we're working really hard together and we continue to do that. And, and certainly the voice of the teacher has to be heard and, and we're focusing on that voice. Yeah, Mr. Collins. Likewise, I think most districts have taken a very similar approach. Um, I've said this before, I think we all have similar questions dealing with the global health pandemic. Uh, how we get to our answers in our respective communities uh, may look a little bit different just simply because we're all gonna be scaled a little bit differently and proportionally with size and community needs. 
Um, we just have the responsibility to be responsive to each one of our community needs. We have uh, likewise done the same thing that uh, Dr. Cleveland has done. We've involved uh, some of our leaders in those decisions. We have about three different committees and our blended learning committee is solely led by our, our faculty members. And so we feel like we've been uh, receptive to uh, their needs, their concerns and, and their desires and tried to listen and tried to address those as much as we can within the resources that we do have. Recognizing that all three of you, as are educators everywhere across uh, the state, across the country, that matter, public and parochial, you are obviously captive to clinical events, uh, uh, biological events that are far beyond your control. One week ago on this broadcast, the uh, chancellor of UAMS said, if we're going to reopen the schools, uh, we need to find, we need to arrive at a plan to shut them down just as quickly. Uh, I'd like to ask you to reflect on that and we'll begin uh, uh, with Dr. Cleveland. Well, we've done that once before. You know, March 13th came on, on us very quickly and we were able to do that. Now, we all were put in the position to where our alternative methods of instruction plan was to go into place. Now, that was an emergency plan created for weather days or events where the electricity's out or something like that. It really wasn't, it wasn't a plan for quality instruction in my view to continue. So uh, what we have coming forward is not alternative methods of instruction the way we knew it in the spring. It is teaching academic standards, moving forward in a qualified and cognizant way to where we are personalizing for each child and each staff member. So it's a, it's a different day, a different look, and we need to be prepared, all of us do, in order to march forward. Hence the idea of having some outside vendors provide the curriculum. Springdale, we're doing it all in-house. We have three different uh, curriculum delivery systems. We have a five-day face-to-face instruction option. We have another option where if parents and students are not comfortable with the five-day face-to-face. They can choose a Monday, a Wednesday, or a Friday, or select a Tuesday, Thursday to try to create an opportunity to, to spread kids out in the classroom. <clears throat> and we have a third option, which is connected to our Don Tyson School of Innovation, and that is a full virtual program. Right. Dr. We're approaching it very similar. Um, I think that all of the school districts across the state have followed the Ready for Learning reentry plan that our department has worked uh, so diligently on uh, putting in place. I think all of us, like Jared said, we're all a little bit better equipped going into the fall uh, semester than we were coming out of the spring. I think, um, as he mentioned, everybody had a short-term plan with the AMI days prior to uh, this national pandemic, and now we're looking more at long-term solutions uh, for providing academic services for our children. And I feel like we're going to be able to pivot as a state department, and the USDOE has kind of put out and given us all the charge of being able to do so within a 48-hour time period. Carol Fleming, that is a real possibility, is it not, and certainly in a worst-case scenario? which the CDC tells us we had best, uh, may evolve to that. What? Uh, that we may evolve yeah. to? An immediate shutdown, go ahead. Oh, yes, no, um, uh, I agree with that. We, as the gentleman have already said, none of us have ever lived through a pandemic. So we are certainly in unprecedented times and um, decisions are being changed from day to day. I do want to go back and say to both superintendents, thank you for listening to the educators in your school district. Your school districts are not what we are hearing from all of our members. And you also have larger school districts. And so I appreciate the fact that Corey Tucker is being involved in Springdale and that Gabrielle um, Halliburton is being involved in West Memphis. So thank you for listening to the voices of the educators, but that is not happening um, across the state. We have school districts who have sent out their ready to learn plans and they have not included the PPC or their faculty leadership. So thank you for including them in your school districts. I wish that we had more continuity across the state on that. 
Some facts, if I could share a couple of things about the two district representatives, who, uh, two districts who are representatives uh, represented on this broadcast. Uh, in Springdale, uh, Dr. Cleveland, you have under your charge 25,000 souls, 22,000 pupils, and another 3,000 personnel. In your student body, 47% are Latino, 13% are Marshallese. That's 60% of your total K-12 enrollment. Uh, and Mr. Collins at West Memphis, uh, more than, well more than half of your K-12 enrollment is African American. Uh, you've got five, more than 5,000 pupils and a, another 700 staff. And I bring that up, the ethnicity factor is essential to consider because we know that uh, communities of color have been the most impacted by by the coronavirus. So, uh, and and doctor, we'll begin with you on this, if I may. Where, the possibility of ex, of, of uh, I don't mean cross contamination, and I'm going blank here. This thing in my ear. Uh, Community space and community distancing, social distancing is going to be extremely difficult, is it not, in a classroom under the best of circumstances? And when you're dealing with heavily impacted uh, ethnic communities, it makes it especially hard, does it not? Well, it, it can. When people are personally responsible and when they take care of themselves, if they take care of themselves, they, in essence, are taking care of their, their families around them and the people that they impact at work around them. So our, our focus here in our district and in our city is to create a culture of care or a community of care. You know, I've worked with uh, the general counsel for the Marshallese yesterday, Eldon Leak. He was in our office and he stayed for a long time and we, we are partnering together. We're going to do some videos together. Um, I'm going to talk to the uh, Marshallese pastors next Friday at 530. We're going to have an educational system of partnership here and we're going to talk about how to re-enter school with children in Springdale. It doesn't matter you know, if you're of color or not. How, how are we gonna come in together as a family and as a community and protect one another? The governor's order yesterday of, of uh, having face coverings, I, th I think is a good thing personally. Um, we've also worked with some commu community partners in, in Tyson. I uh, went to the Tyson Berry Street plant last Friday toured the Berry Street plant to try to learn from the people who are leading that program, learn from the people who are working in the facility of what worked, what hasn't worked, and what they need us to do for their children in our school whenever school opens up. So um, I don't really know if I, if I hit the portions of your question that I needed to, but the aspects that we're focusing on is a culture of care of all children a educational system uh, that suits the needs of all children and families that are out there that we serve. And number three, continue to learn from our medical professionals and the people that are out there focusing on keeping others safe in the environments in which they work. Well, I guess so. so. If we can focus on those areas, Mr. Barnes, we're going to be a lot better early. Well, let me go to Mr. Collins and refine the question just, uh, just a bit. Do you and do other school districts are? Do you have the resources? Have the resources been made been made available to you to do the best you can in terms of social distancing, uh, other other uh, uh, parts of the protocol to to prevent further community spread? I think if you ask any superintendent, any CEO that deals with a, uh, a very populated workforce. Um, it's kind of a loaded question. Uh, I think there's always a need for more. I think if you ask anybody in the healthcare industry right now, when we were first getting into this global pandemic, um, you know, the, the governor's briefing yesterday, um, just the resources of, of beds available in hospitals across the state, uh, that could, you know, that could come into question as well as we progress through this. Uh, I don't know if there's ever going to be enough resources in, in anybody's mind to tackle all of the unknowns that we continue to to, you know, guesstimate that we'll face. Um, I think that uh, USDOE, the president's office, uh, governor's office and the ADE through the CARES Act funding have uh, tried to reach, make those dollars reach as far as they can. 
uh, most superintendents that uh, that are that are working in our state and particularly in the Mid South region that we've had conversation with have tried to be very um, systematic in our thought, very responsible in trying to stretch those dollars to get the biggest return on our investment for PPE and protection services and equipment and electronic devices to basically service our kids, hotspot devices. And uh, much of rural Arkansas and the Mississippi River Delta is no different. We face a lot of areas that have gaps in Wi-Fi access. And so, you know, that brings a whole other level of concerns. If we have to shut completely down and go virtual, how do we accurately provide services and how do we how do we get those services returned to us for assessment purposes and so you know one solution today only leads to another question and another layer of issues tomorrow and i, I think we're trying to tackle those as best we can within the resources we have let me let me and i would like to go into that if we can time permitting but let me begin with miss fleming and and share with you a a quote that i got from a an arkansas school superintendent a couple of days ago she told me, uh, I don't know how many youngsters I'm going, how many students I'm going to have on opening day. And she added, I'm not even sure how many faculty I will have on, on opening day. So I have not seen any, couldn't find any surveys on public attitudes in Arkansas specifically, but I was struck by a nationwide poll that I saw a couple of days ago, which indicates a modest to large uh, risk concern on a part of 70% of U.S. parents. When they questioned African-American parents, it went up to 90% apprehension rate and 80% among Latino uh, parents, Hispanic parents. Uh, are some of your members considering, Ms. Fleming, leaving? So, as you had mentioned earlier, we did conduct a survey and we had just under 6,200 educators from across the state of Arkansas, including all 75 counties who completed our survey. And what we found was that 40% were considering leaving the profession or retiring early. And that's a concern. We have a shortage in education. And so that is a very striking concern. But typically, nationwide, even the Bureau of Legislative Research shows that you have 30% from year to year that you may lose through attrition or through um, attrition through retirement or uh, leaving the profession to go to another career because of the stress that comes from working in education. Well, Mr. Collins, uh, Dr. Cleveland, let me ask you, are, is there concern on your part, your, your faculty that, uh, uh, your school boards that you may not have adequate faculty and that there might be a, a sharp drop in uh, in-person enrollment? Absolutely. When you have so, when you have 22,000 students, uh, every student matters and every teacher matters. We're having a, a real issue with our bus drivers. I don't know what's happening with John over there, but the average age of our bus drivers is pretty high. And when you start looking at the, um, uh, at the rates of uh, death, for 65 and over, I saw in the newspaper last weekend, I believe it was, that 10% of the cases are 65 and over and 71% of the deaths. Well, that's a staggering statistic to me, and that's worrisome for the people that are in that category. Well, if your bus drivers are in that category, most of them, then naturally they're going to be pretty scared. So we're losing them. Uh, I believe yesterday we were down 17. We were able to recover four yesterday. So now we're, we're at 12 or 13 shy still. And we stay shy of bus drivers most of the year. That's just the norm. But this year, it's going to be even worse. For our staff members, there are staff members who could retire, who are choosing to do so now, even though the mask order has been issued, that the plans of how to arrange classrooms and separate students in classrooms are coming about. And they're very innovative, by the way. Or if you, if you want to see innovation at work, go see a teacher. Uh, watch she or he in the classroom and see what they do. They're very innovative. So that's that's happening. But the the worry about how the disease or the, the virus can impact them personally or the people they love at home, that is a tremendous, tremendous worry to them, which in turn is a tremendous worry to the people that care about them, which are their administrators and their co-faculty. Yeah, West Memphis, Mr. Collins. I would echo Jared's sentiments there. Um, we've uh, 
work. I, I don't know of a public school district anywhere that's in charge of their own transportation that doesn't have a concern or a shortage of bus drivers. And so that one department by itself, um, there's well, we're talking about cafeteria needs. workers also and support mm -hmm. staff, other support staff too. Yeah, you, you find out real quick when you start laying your departments out. Um, obviously, you can't have school if you can't get the children to school. Once they get to school, we know, as Miss Fleming mentioned earlier, there's so much more that goes on in a school day than just teaching academics. It's a social, it's emotional growth, it's nutritional value, um, it's the love and the care. And so, you know, everybody that essentially opens the door to, uh, until the time they close it are considered essential. Um, we feel like we've got some pretty good safety precautions and measures in place. We understand just like any other entity across the United States, it's a calculated risk when they report to work. Uh, we're trying to do exactly what you opened up with uh, in your initial question is educate our personnel and our students and our parents and our community um, as much as we possibly can about what we do know today. And we also have to recognize that what we do know today uh, that may change between now and Monday. And so the, uh, the information process is, has to be pretty fluid. There has to be a lot of patience exercise through this. We have the same concerns. Um, if a teacher has reservations or, or contracts COVID-19, what are the ripple effects of that right. in the classroom? Vice versa, if a student contracts it um, or a family member. And, uh, you know, and then, and then you have to look at, you have to have a contingency plan for substitute teachers and how you're going to allow that, that third party to enter your building and the layers of complications that that brings in, in and of itself. So yeah, Mr. Collins, for, I've got, yeah, I've got to cut you off because we have the clock is cutting us off. We're simply out of time. Gotcha. President Fleming, gentlemen, thank you very much for being with us. Good luck to all of you. Thank okay. you for watching. See you next week. Support for Arkansas Week provided by the Arkansas Democrat Gazette, the Arkansas Times, and KUAR-FM 89.